Let me just introduce, just make the link between uh, the, 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 the previous presentations and, uh, and this one very briefly. Uh, so, um, the, Catherine has presented the, the six working groups uh, that are in operation. One of them uh, is dedicated to architecture, the, the EOSC Architecture Working Group, which I share. And uh, within that working group, we have organized two task forces, one on AI and one on uh, persistent identifiers. So during this session, you will hear uh, Christos, uh, and I take the opportunity to thank Christos Canelopoulos to, to make the presentation today. Uh, and as he said in the intro slide, uh, this presentation is on behalf of the AI task force, which I just mentioned. Similarly, this afternoon, uh, there will be a presentation of persistent identifiers with the same uh, spirit, the same mechanism. So with that as an intro, uh, I will let uh, the floor to Christos. Christos? Uh, thank you very much, Joshua. Uh, hello, everyone. So, uh, as Donald Francois said, this is um, uh, a presentation about the work I've been doing in the EOSC AI task force. Uh, the task force was, uh, one moment, oops, okay. The task force was uh, created in October last year, and uh, the mandate we were given was uh, to deliver a consistent architecture for authentication and authorization and access control for the European Open Science Cloud. So uh, the task force is, uh, has uh, 24 members from various uh, disciplines. So we have members from uh, research communities, research infrastructures, from national initiatives, but also from the infrastructures. So we have a very good and balanced group of people contributing to the work of this group. Uh, and the group is chaired by Klaus Vierenga from Zeant and Leif Johansson from, from SUNET. So uh, uh, when we uh, put together the task force um, and the charter, we set out for uh, four goals. Uh, the first one was to take one step back. Um, a lot of things have happened in the context of AI uh, with previous initiatives like the authentication authorization for resource collaboration, ARC initiatives uh, within the context of EOS Hub. So we said, okay, now we're at the point where we have a lot of input. Uh, let's take one step back to uh, revisit where we are, revisit what are the first principles, what is important and what is less, less important, and also what are our requirements. Uh, so the first goal is exactly first principles and requirements for the EOSKI. And then uh, to provide a baseline architecture, the starting point for, for the EOSKI. Uh, we do expect that the EOSKI will be uh, something that will continuously evolve as the needs and requirements for accessing uh, and sharing resources to EOSK will, um, uh, will continue to grow. And uh, within the goal of, of, of this task force was A, to provide the initial baseline uh, that we call EOSK architecture, AI Architecture 2019. Uh, and that would be our starting point. And then uh, towards the end of the year to have uh, an, an iteration over that architecture, which we call EOS, uh, AI Architecture 2020. And I will say a few more uh, things about this in a few moments. In addition to this, uh, we set also two other goals for this task force. One was to provide a catalog of good examples. What is already out there? How can it be used, etc. <coughs> and also very important, Rules of participation. This is linked to the presentation that was um, uh, made a few minutes ago uh, from, uh, from one uh, as the result of the uh, rules of participation of working group. This is basically where we want to provide our feedback as from the point of view of the AI, what are the rules of participation for resource providers, for users, for research communities, but also for identity providers. All these uh, components in the EOSK AI ecosystem that we have uh, to work together. So uh, let's start with uh, the first principles. So um, uh, users, uh, whether in the form of researchers, graduate students, teachers, or even administrators, are the reason why we build IT infrastructures of any kind. 
the authentication and authorization process is necessary part of the security risk management for infrastructure for any IT service. So AI is important, but it is important in order to drive the user experience. So the first measure that we set and the foremost uh, principle is that user experience should be the first measure of success. The second point was, uh, the second principle was that all trust flows from the communities. And I will expand a bit more about this in a few moments. And the third principle, which is also very important, is that the EOSC AI itself and the EOSC is going to be a federation infrastructure, a federation of services. It is inherently a distributed system and there is no center in a distributed system. So this applies also for the EOSC AI. There is no center within the context of or concept of the EOSC AI itself. There should be no center. So let's dig a bit deeper um, about the uh, user experience aspects. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, authentication authorization process uh, is, is really a necessary part of the security and risk management infrastructure for any IT service, in this case for EOSC. Security, while important, must always be deployed in conjunction with proper risk management to avoid over-engineering security controls at the expense of usability. Again, linking back to the, to the problem of, of user-centric approach. We build technology for users, not for technologies. Since the process of authenticating to and updating the rights to use an IT service has no intrinsic value itself, it must be made as unobtrusive and as humanly possible. Uh, in EOS, what we want to adapt is a scientific approach to usability and quantify, measure, and evaluate services from a usability perspective. As I said, access to EOSC should be as unobtrusive as humanly possible. Regarding the second principle, uh, all trust flows from the communities. It is very important here to highlight that trust does not derive from technology itself. Technology can enable trust, but Trust derives and emerges from the property of the communities and the research collaborations that will be using EOS. Communities may act as an interface between individual users and the resources. The EOS AI should build on the trust that exists within the well-managed scientific collaborations and also provide the necessary structures to cater for all those cases that are not covered by a given specific scientific discipline. For example, uh, the long tail of science of users, how they will be fit in. But from the context of trust, the trust anchor will be the community themselves. So EOSKI will be a trust mortar within which many such scientific communities, collaborations, and infrastructures can coexist and interoperate. What is very important is taking into account in the design decision is what works today for the users should and will work tomorrow, but our goal is only to make it better. The third principle is that there is no center in a distributed system. Uh, this has been a very common misconception that uh, there is going to be a single EOSKI, a singular instance of what would be the EOSKI architecture. Uh, this is very far from the truth. Uh, the way that we see the EOSKI is that it, it is a set of principles and governance structures for how the architecture is applied, is evolving, and grows over time. The objective of the EOSKI is not to create a central structure that will control users or that will build walled gardens, but rather to provide an open and fair playing field for service delivery to the scientific community. So starting with these uh, three principles, basically uh, we will use them and we have started using them as our driving force uh, for, for defining the EOSKI. And I'm saying define the EOSKI, but actually one of the very first things that we have discussed even before uh, we started working in the task force was that by no means should we reinvent the wheel. 
Um, I mentioned about ARC in my introduction. Uh, ARC, which stands for authentication and authorization for research collaboration, has been a set of uh, projects, initiatives in our community that has been active since many years now, since 2015 and which had its roots in actual uh, other activities that I think go back even 2011, which has created an open dialogue between technologists, infrastructure providers, communities, research infrastructures, in order to understand what are the requirements for an AI that will enable seamless access to resources. So within the context of EOSC AI, we want to uh, adapt the ARC Blueprint architecture with all of its extensions and the ongoing governance that is provided by the EDGES group and use this as a starting point for the work ahead. Uh, in particular, I'm going to more detail a bit, uh, the ARC BPA builds on existing best practices in the scientific community and that is something that we want to, um, to adopt. It provides clear guidance for how campus identities integrate with science and comes with the beginnings of a governance structure in the edges group uh, that um, we can uh, talk a bit more uh, a bit later. And also something very important, it has international buy-in. Uh, the art movement architecture is not something confined within the European uh, borders, but it's something that already has adoption outside of, of Europe, in, uh, in uh, the US, in Canada, in uh, Latin America, in Asia Pacific region. So uh, the starting point for the EOSKI architecture is um, the ARC Blueprint Architecture version 2019 that was published um, last October. Um, the ARC Blueprint Architecture basically defines an architecture of uh, five layers where we have to split the identities at the top layer and this, uh, there you can find all the possible identity sources Campuses, universities, research institutions being one type of such identities coming in from Medigain, but also we envision connection with other identity sources such as social IDs, other identity systems like ORCID, governmental IDs from EI Dust that are becoming more and more used nowadays in Europe, uh, but also potentially identity providers coming from the uh, commercial sector potentially. At the bottom layer, we have the services. Services providing resources to the EOS users and, and communities. And they need to be able to consume identities in a homogeneous manner. Uh, at the left side, you see what we call the community attribute services. This is basically what, where we define communities and the community structures. So users, individual users, being able to authenticate other home organizations using social IDs, they will be able to join communities, be assigned access rights, be assigned roles within these communities, and then they should be able to consume resources provided to those communities. But of course, access has to be able to be authorized. Not all services or all resources are provided or can be provided to everyone. Perhaps some communities have specific rights over given data sets, so the authorization aspect is very important. And at the center of this architecture, we have what we call the access protocol translation layer. Basically, this is the glue that brings everything together. Uh, if I was to uh, describe the art blueprint architecture in one term, I would say this is a proxy architecture. Event effectively, we have a, a layer where acts as an integration point between all the other components, between the identity sources, resource providers, service providers, communities that they want to consume, and consume them, and then technologies and authorization frameworks that make it possible to have seamless access to these uh, services. On top of, of this basic um, uh, architecture, we have uh, already been uh, working on uh, deployment uh, implementations. And you see in the second and third graphs in, in your screen, basically how we see things actually working within the context of the EOS AI. Basically, we will have communities operating or having the community AIs operated by third parties, 
that can allow them to consume identities from multiple sources. Through the community AIs, they will be able to consume their own services. And they will be able to consume generic services available to multiple communities, but also they will be able to consume services provided by generic infrastructure providers through a structure that we call the infrastructure proxy. So uh, this is the general model. Uh, it, it doesn't change basic many things of what we have been doing in the past. Actually, it builds up, 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 up on those. And this is also the work that we are currently doing um, right now, also in the context of EOSCAB. And we will hear more about this during, during the EOSCAB week. So uh, working on, on, the, on the architecture and using the ARC uh, blueprint architecture as a starting point, Perhaps the most important thing that um, uh, we are doing at this level is identifying the gaps, what we're still missing, and what are the challenges that we need to address in the next months. And we have already identified three very broad areas of challenges. And these are, first of all, the community and attributes and how they are linked to authorization. Uh, how multi-infrastructure workflows can work and scalability. And let me expand a bit on this. Uh, regarding the community attributes and authorization, um, we have received a number of comments that communities are not the only source of attributes for access control. And indeed, uh, whether a user should be able to access a good resource or data set might be a factor um, related to different authorization endpoints and have different entities having a say in, the, in, these, in these decisions. So this is something that we need to take into account that it's not only the roles and the access rights that the, a user might have within a given community, it might be also other factors like for example a given grant that the user might have received from a funding body that would determine whether they would be able to access uh, certain resources under, under which terms. Uh, also, attributes may not only be user specific, but uh, they might also be specific to other contexts, and therefore not necessarily managed by the community itself. And the last point uh, is that um, we have been lacking a community attribute profile. So we were talking about attributes in an abstract manner to, that would enable authorization uh, to services that would enable a homogeneous, consistent representation of the users for the services. But what that community attribute profile would look like is something that we're still missing. Having said this, we have already started working uh, in creating just such an, an attribute profile for, for EOS. And this is something that actually we have taken up as a work in, uh, as a work in the international community in ARC to create an international profile that we can then take and adapt for the needs of, of EOSP itself. Uh, the second uh, challenging topic um, is uh, a use case that is um, rather complex, but also very common. So one use case that we have been facing again and again, and that we cannot uh, um, address with the current architecture, is the case where we have services, compute services, for example, provided by one infrastructure, and then data services provided by another infrastructure. So a user would like to use something like a Jupyter Notebook service provided by infrastructure A, do their calculations, experiment, then do some big runs, and when the experiment finishes, to be able to have the, the data stored at a data store service provided by another infrastructure. Today, the current trust model that we have uh, cannot cater for this. It expects that basically all services used in the context of a given flow would be behind the same proxy. So we have already identified this, this problem uh, quite some time now, and uh, we are already thinking of how this can be solved. And actually we expect that um, within the next months, we'll be able to have the first implementation uh, that we can use also in the context of the EOSK AI to be, really, to be able to deliver this functionality. Uh, lastly, the third, the third challenge and group of challenges is scalability. Uh, 
when our blueprint architecture 2019 was introduced and it, it brought the logical separation between the community AIs and the infrastructure proxies, the assumption was that there would be a number of communities, a big number of communities, and that the number of infrastructure proxies providing services could be rather low. This assumption is, um, is good as a starting point, but we already see that uh, the number of resource providers and infrastructure pro proxies connecting to providers will grow significantly. We will have national proxies, we're going to have thematic proxies, research infrastructures will be providing their own services to, uh, to their own proxies. So this is something that we need to be able to deal within the architecture. And we need to deal with this in a scalable manner. Today, the trust between the various components of the EOS KI is more or less established on a manual basis. It does follow a set of interoperability principles that come with uh, the guidelines, but still the connection between the components is, is a manual process. This is something that we definitely have to get away from and we need to be able to provide a scalable way of connecting resource providers, identity providers within, within, the, um, within the infrastructure. Which brings us also to the, the following question. What also are the rules for participation for all of these entities, components? What are the rules for participation for community AIs, for infrastructure proxies and other AI services? In this regard also, we have already started uh, working on a, on a model where we see that the EOSKI will grow from uh, a set of uh, rules and principles and manual connections to a more federated approach where basically each entity will be able to connect once and be made available to all other entities without having to, to establish these bilateral connections with its entity within, within the EOSKI. We do expect that we should have also something in this regard by the end of this year. So uh, this brings me close to basically this, this uh, very short introduction of 20 minutes, uh, just to also give you the, the, the timeline again. Uh, in, in April, uh, we, we finished the work on the EOSKI first principles. Uh, we have already finished the work on the EOSK AI architecture 2019, and now it goes through the, the process of being um, uh, uh, published uh, at the EOSK um, uh, Secretariat website and to be uh, approved by the, uh, by the processes. So we should expect that this should be there sometime in June. And we have already started the gathering requirements and use cases, and we do expect to have uh, the document in the September period that will describe all the requirements and use cases that we have gathered through this time. And all this information will be used to feed, back, to feed it back to the development of the next version of the ArcBPA, which we wanted to bring it more closer to the needs of, of EOS, and then use this to profile the EOS KI architecture of 2020 that should come by the end of the year and which include, will include also the rules of participation, but also examples of, of um, uh, technologies that can be used and are already out there to be able to build uh, AI components for research infrastructures. And with this, I think I'm, I'm already at the 20 minutes uh, time limit. So uh, I think we can open the floor for discussions now, if you want to dive into some particular aspects uh, to go more in depth or have generic questions, please. Thanks a lot, Christos. So please try to raise your hand just to, so that we can uh, manage uh, the discussion. But uh, aside from that, the floor is to the whole group. Question to Christos. Zanfrasoua, just a comment because I cannot see the the, the chat. Uh, if there is any question, please, if you can relate to me. Uh, but perhaps I can take the opportunity because I heard in the previous session uh, there was a question about uh, 
non-academic identity providers. And for sure, this is something that we are uh, working on, how this could be integrated. We already, in the architecture, we support the connection of non-academic identity providers. And uh, how to bring in identity providers from the commercial world, this is still being discussed, how they can connect, but it is, it is for sure within our um, vision of, of, of what we want to deliver as part of the USKI. Christos, Christos, we have two questions. Uh, one from Matej. So, yeah. hi. Um, the question regarding the proxy and kind of from the point of the point of view of the service provider. Um, what does that mean? So, I mean, until now, the situation is that basically each service provider has to uh, exchange metadata with which every ID, uh, identity provider more or less or through the federations if i understand correctly uh would that then who would that mean that we will only have n to one and one to n then afterwards when there is a proxy so that every idp will only have a contract with a proxy and every service provider contract with a proxy with basically uh and then who runs the proxy or yeah uh, very very good question thank you very much actually there's not going to be one proxy and that's why that's one of the first principles that i mentioned at the very beginning uh, that uh, there is no center in the decentralized uh, architecture but, so but we, per we, community right yes we, we expect that there is going to be multiple proxies uh, at the national level uh, uh, european level multiple ones so but we do expect services to have one connection point so from the point of view of the service and the identity provider, they should connect once and they should be made available to all the communities and users in terms of, of the AI aspects. So the principle is exactly what you said, but it's not going to be one central service provided hmm. to, to do this. One central, okay. But so it could be, for example, a national uh, identity federation. Yes. It could be a proxy. They're going to be at the national level. Uh, the work we're doing on the scalability actually will bring possibly also the concept of the EOS Federation itself, where uh, uh, such proxies can connect directly to automate the trust uh, relationships between all these components. But again, a, a, a very important principle is that each service provider will have to connect once to one entry point and it would be possible for all users to be able to access. Service providers not have to go and connect to multiple entity entry points in order to serve different communities. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, Matej, if you can lower your hand. Uh, uh, now there uh, is a... Maybe one follow, brief follow-up follow question. When, so when will this start to happen? Uh, 21 or is there, I mean, you showed the time plan, but it's all, this is all blueprint and papers. When will this be kind of in implementation or in, in production? Actually, it is not all, all, all group in the papers. Uh, we have already um, production services running. Uh, we have already a set of, of production proxies connected and serving communities right now. Uh, we're not there at the, le at the level of scalability that we wanted it to be. So, um, and this is what, what we're proving. So the basic structure is already there. Within the context of EOS Hub, we're doing the initial integration of those. And this is where we show also all these limitations in terms of scalability. And we have brought this in this discussion in the EOS KI task force to see how we can improve uh, this, um, uh, this aspect. So it is not just paper work, it is basically implementation happening that drives also the architecture at the paper side. Thank you. Uh, we had a question from Dragana Radulovic, but I don't see it anymore. Maybe she was disconnected. I don't know. Okay, other questions? Please raise your hand. And in the chat, maybe class, uh, you, you're thanks a lot for following the chat. Uh, do you want to summarize for everybody, uh, you know, the 
the answers that well the questions and the answers that you were uh, that you monitored in the chat class can you hear me now yes yeah okay yeah i could not unmute myself um yeah so um there were a number of questions about the the role of the proxy and the proxy being a single point of failure um a, a an anchor a trust anchor for a whole community and um i i wrote down that there will be multiple uh, proxies one per community there was a bit of uh, discussion about what a community is um and there were remarks to the extent that security is going to be very important and incident response and uh, the answer to that is uh, obviously yes <laughs> and um, I, I think the other important one is the relation with what happens after this year and how the output of um, the, the working groups is going to be picked up in infra ESCO 3 and infra ESCO 7 and uh, as um, one of the authors of the infra ESCO 3 proposal uh, that uh, a group of e-infras and research infras are, are putting together I can say that that is taken as input uh, the, 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 the output of the architecture working group is taken as the starting point for infra ESCO 3 and, uh, and and will have to be picked up by infra ESCO 7 as well um, I think that is most of it let me quickly scroll through um, yeah there are some some useful pointers Shadaf may uh, put in a pointer for people that want to know more and, and I, in general I think it would be very useful to read up on the art blueprint architecture if you have not done so because that contains a lot of the thinking behind uh, this presentation Thanks, class. Uh, we have a question from uh, Gergely Sipos. So, go ahead. Yeah. So my, my question is: Hi, I'm Gergely Sipos from EGI. Is that on the last slide your timeline showed that there will be first a release of the architecture and then a, a collection of requirements and use cases? Mm, uh, huh? No. Uh, actually, the day that you see here is the publication of the document. So we have already started uh, gathering requirements and use cases. And um, as I said previously, we have not started from scratch. Uh, we have taken up the initial set of requirements and use cases coming from ARC and, and EOS Hub. And we are now in the process of arranging them. Uh, EOS KI Architects 2019 is basically our starting point from what we have already gotten from, from other activities. And there we identified what we're still missing. So we're still working on getting more requirements, more use cases, and we expect to conclude this by September. And that will drive the ARC BPA 2020 and the EOS KI 2020 architecture. Thank so the arrows you see here are, are not when is not when the work starts, but when we expect to have the results. Okay, Gary, does that answer your question? Oh, you're muted. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. How do we do that? I can't find you in the list. I've unmuted already. Okay, Gary. Yeah, Kelly, you, you yeah have... now now I am I'm, I'm muted. Uh, so th thank you for the answer. So this point in requirements and use cases September, does that mean that a survey will be opened, or does it mean that you will publish a document? And if you publish a document in September, how do you collect input for that and when? So we have already started collecting input from various communities and uh, classes that we are in touch with at the moment. 
Uh, we're doing this for multiple channels, but I do expect that um, in the beginning of summer, uh, possibly in June, that we have uh, also perhaps a more uh, formal communication for uh, generic input for use cases. Uh, this is something that we're discussing in the AI task force at the moment, but we're already receiving uh, a lot of input for, for, from many of the um, uh, cluster research infrastructures that we're working with. Okay. Any, so thanks a lot. Uh, any other question? Well, it, it, uh, as Christos explained, in general, the, the, the document from the AI working group, the four uh, topics that were mentioned by Christos early in his presentation uh, are starting to get out. So the first principles uh, section will get out. And similarly, uh, so I assume the dialogue uh, between the task force and the community will uh, develop uh, that way, and uh, I'm sure if you want to input use cases uh, to the task force, they'll be more than happy to listen to those uh, to to listen to those use cases. 